Book One, The Church of the Conquerors, Part Two, of The Prophets of Religion by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Priestly Empires In every human society of which we have record, there has been one class which has done the hard and exhausting work, the hewers of wood and drawers of water. And there has been another, much smaller class, which has done the directing. To belong to this latter class is to work also, but with the head instead of the hands. It is also to enjoy the good things of life, to live in the best houses, to eat the best food, to have choice of the most desirable women. It is to have leisure to cultivate the mind and appreciate the arts, to acquire graces and distinctions, to give laws and moral codes, to shape fashions and tastes, to be revered and regarded, in short, to have power. How to get this power and to hold it has been the first object of the thoughts of men from the beginning of time. The most obvious method is by the sword, but this method is uncertain, for any man may take up a sword, and some may succeed with it. It will be found that empires based upon military force alone, however cruel they may be, are not permanent, and therefore not so dangerous to progress. It is only when resistance is paralyzed by the agency of superstition that the race can be subjected to systems of exploitation for hundreds and even thousands of years. The ancient empires were all priestly empires. The kings ruled because they obeyed the will of the priests, taught to them from childhood as the word of the gods. Thus, for instance, Prescott tells us, Terror, not love, was the spring of education with the Aztecs. Such was the crafty policy of the priests, who, by reserving to themselves the business of instruction, were enabled to mold the young and plastic mind according to their own wills, and to train it early to implicit reverence for religion and its ministers. The historian goes on to indicate the economic harvest of this teaching. To each of the principal temples, lands were annexed for the maintenance of the priests. The estates were augmented by the policy or devotion of successive princes, until, under the last Montezuma, they had swollen to an enormous extent, and covered every district of the empire. And this concerning the frightful system of human sacrifices, whereby the priestly caste maintained the prestige of its divinities. At the dedication of the temple of Huitzilopochtli in 1486, the prisoners, who for some years had been reserved for the purpose, were ranged in files, forming a procession nearly two miles long. The ceremony consumed several days, and seventy thousand captives are said to have perished at the shrine of this terrible deity. The same system appears in Professor Jastrow's account of the priesthood of Babylonia and Assyria. The ultimate source of all law being the deity himself, the original legal tribunal was the place where the image or symbol of the god stood. A legal decision was an oracle or omen, indicative of the will of the god. The power thus lodged in the priests of Babylonia and Assyria was enormous. They virtually held in their hands the life and death of the people and of the business side of this vast religious system. The temples were the natural depositories of the legal archives, which in the course of centuries grew to veritably enormous proportions. Records were made of all decisions. 
the facts were set forth and duly attested by witnesses. Business and marriage contracts, loans and deeds of sale, were in like manner drawn up in the presence of official scribes, who were also priests. In this way all commercial transactions received the written sanction of the religious organization. The temples themselves, at least in the large centers, entered into business relations with the populace. In order to maintain the large household represented by such an organization as that of the temple of Enlil of Nippur, that of Nin Girsu at Lagash, that of Marduk at Babylon, or that of Shamash at Sippar, large holdings of land were required which, cultivated by agents for the priests, or farmed out with stipulations for a goodly share of the produce, secured an income for the maintenance of the temple officials. The enterprise of the temples was expanded to the furnishing of loans at interest, in later periods at twenty per cent, to barter in slaves, to dealings in lands, besides engaging labor for work of all kinds directly needed for the temples. A large quantity of the business documents found in the temple archives are concerned with the business affairs of the temple, and we are justified in including the temples and the large centers as among the most important business institutions of the country. In financial or monetary transactions, the position of the temples was not unlike that of national banks. And so on. We may venture the guess that the learned professor said more in that last sentence than he himself intended, for his lectures were delivered in that temple of plutocracy, the University of Pennsylvania, and paid out of an endowment which specifies that all polemical subjects shall be positively excluded. Prayer Wheels These priestly empires exist in the world today. If we wish to find them, we have only to ask ourselves, what countries are making no contribution to the progress of the race? What countries have nothing to give us, whether in art, science, or industry? For example, Gervais tells us of the Talapoins, or priests of Siam, that they are exempted from all public charges, they salute nobody, while everybody prostrates himself before them. They are maintained at the public expense. In the same way we read of the Negroes of the Caribbean islands that their priests and priestesses exercise an almost unlimited power. Miss Kingsley, in her West African Studies, tells us that if we desire to understand the institutions of this district, we must study the native's religion. For his religion has so firm a grasp upon his mind that it influences everything he does. It is not a thing apart, as the religion of the Europeans is at times. The African cannot say, Oh, that is all right from a religious point of view, but one must be practical. To be practical, to get on in the world, to live the day and night through, he must be right in the religious point of view, namely, must be on working terms with the great world of spirits around him. The knowledge of this spirit world constitutes the religion of the African, and his customs and ceremonies arise from his idea of the best way to influence it. Or consider Henry Savage Lander's account of Tibet. In Lhasa and many other sacred places, fanatical pilgrims make circumambulations, sometimes for miles and miles and for days together, covering the entire distance lying flat upon their bodies. From the ceiling of the temple hang hundreds of long strips, katas, 
offered by pilgrims to the temple, and becoming so many flying prayers when hung up, for mechanical praying in every way is prominent in Tibet. Thus, instead of having to learn by heart long and varied prayers, all you have to do is to stuff the entire prayer book into a prayer wheel, and revolve it while repeating as fast as you can four words meaning, O oh God, the gem emerging from the lotus flower. The attention of the pilgrims is directed to a large box, or often a big bowl, where they may deposit whatever offerings they can spare. And it must be said that their religious ideas are so strongly developed that they will dispose of a considerable portion of their money in this fashion. The lamas are very clever in many ways, and have a great hold over the entire country. They are ninety percent of them unscrupulous scamps, depraved in every way and given to every sort of vice. So are the women lamas. They live and sponge on the credulity and ignorance of the crowds. It is to maintain this ignorance, upon which their luxurious life depends, that foreign influence of every kind is strictly kept out of the country. THE BUTCHER GODS In this last sentence we have summed up the fundamental fact about institutionalized religion. Wherever belief and ritual have become the means of livelihood of a class, all innovation will of necessity be taken as an attack upon that class. It will be literally a crime, robbing the priests of their age-long privileges. And of course they will oppose the robber, using every weapon of terrorism, both of this world and the next. They will require the submission not merely of their own people, but of their neighbors, and their jealousy of rival priestly castes will be a cause of wars. The story of the early days of mankind is a sickening record of torture and slaughter in the name of ten thousand butcher gods. Thus, for example, we read in the Hebrew religious records how the priests were engaged in establishing the prestige of a fetish called the Ark, and how the people of one tribe violated this fetish and wakened the wrath of Jehovah, the God. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked into the Ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people fifty thousand and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented, because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? This terrible old Hebrew divinity said of himself that he was a jealous God. Throughout the time of his sway, he issued through his ministers precise instructions for the most revolting cruelties, the extermination of whole nations of men, women, and children, whose sole offense was that they did not pay tribute to Jehovah's priests. Thus, for example, the chief of his prophets, Moses, called the people together, and with all solemnity and with many warnings, handed down ten commandments graven upon stone tablets. He went on to set forth how the people were to set upon and rob their neighbors, and gave them these bloodthirsty instructions. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. But thus shall ye deal with them. 
ye shall destroy their altars, and break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The records of this Jehovah are full of similar horrors. He sent his chosen people out to destroy the Midianites, and they slew all the males, but this was not sufficient, and Moses was wroth, and commanded them to kill all the married women, and to take the single women for themselves. We are told that sixteen thousand single women were spared, of whom the Lord's tribute was thirty and two. In the book of Joshua we read that he had an interview with a supernatural personage called the Captain of the Lord's Host, and how this captain had given to him a magic spell which would destroy the city of Jericho. The city should be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. Every living thing except one traitor harlot was to be slaughtered, and all the wealth of the city reserved to the priestly caste. This was carried out to the letter, except that Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. That is, he hid some gold and silver in his tent, whereupon the army met with a defeat, and everybody knew that something was wrong, and Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord, and got another message from Jehovah, to the effect that the guilty man should be burned with fire, he and all that he hath. And Joshua, and all Israel with him, took Achan the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire, after they had stoned him with stones. We have no means of knowing what was the character of the unfortunate inhabitants of the city of Jericho, nor of the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and all the rest of the victims of Jehovah. To be sure, we are told by the Hebrew priests that they sacrificed their children to their gods. But then, consider what we should believe about the Hebrew religion if we took the word of rival priestly castes. Consider, for example, that in this twentieth century we saw an Orthodox Jew tried in a Russian court of law for having made a sacrifice of Christian babies. Nevertheless, we know that the Jews represent a considerable part of the intelligence and idealism of Russia. We know in the same way that the Moors had most of the culture and all of the scientific knowledge of Spain, that the Huguenots had most of the conscience and industry of France, and we know that they were massacred or driven out to death by the priestly castes of the Middle Ages. End of Book 1, Part 2